I'm addicted to WikiHow. I'm sorry. I have a new... <laughs> you don't need to apologize. It is <laughs> so fucking funny sometimes. I, I will literally new... just scroll sometimes through them because they are so funny. They're very interesting, and I don't want to diss any WikiHow writers because I know this is a way of income for some people, but somebody wrote an article called How to Behave Around Queer People If You Don't Accept Them. <laughs> It made me wonder, who's this article for? There are a bunch of bigots reading WikiHow, and they're like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to treat people with human decency. Oh my god. Sorry, this tangent here. This makes me think, I was driving to your house the other day, and I got stuck behind this guy in this super beat up, like, Toyota Camry from probably 20 years ago, and it had a Let's Go Brandon sticker on it, and I was like, why like what the fuck is wrong with people <laughs> dude was a complete asshole by the way he sped around like multiple people while we were stopped on london road to try and turn it was just yeah, an, or an asshole or at least don't become a self-fulfilling prophecy for your bumper stickers <laughs> or do it's just uh, the label so that we know what kind of person you might be i know part of me was like what if i just pull in front of him and he has to stare at all of my bumper stickers my beautiful bumper stickers but i was like i don't really want to get hate crime today <laughs> Yeah. So here's some advice. If you are someone who might not like the LGBTQ community, number one is stay away from gay folks if you can't help but express your dislike. So we're we're going the Bambi method here. So we're just starting off. How to be around queer folks. If you don't like them and you can't hide it, just don't be around them. That sounds honestly, gay folks don't want to be around you either. It's true. If your intention is to try to hurt someone, either emotionally or physically, I'd say staying away from them is a good idea. And it actually says, if you are in a situation where you are around a gay person, you can say, you can excuse yourself and say, I don't like gay people, (laughs) if needed. This is much less harmful than a rant against them. I agree. But again, I'm angry with this article because I'd rather (laughs) you just... And be accepting of other human beings. Listen, as a gay person, if you walk up to me and we're hanging out and then you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't like gay people, and you excuse yourself and walk away, that will fucking make my day, and I will share that <laughs> everywhere. Because that is the funniest because shit I would have heard know. all day. <laughs> Number two is politely steer queer. Ste- nope, politely not steer, steer queer. queer. Wow. <laughs> Oh my god. That's good. <laughs> Number two is politely steer clear of LGBTQ subjects when possible. Say, I don't like to talk about that and change the subject. This way you can avoid hurting people's feelings and losing friends. I'm sorry if somebody is expressing <laughs> their queerness to you and you're like, I don't like to talk about that. I think you probably are going to lose that friend anyway. Listen, listen. I talk about queer stuff all the time because it is part of my job and part of just being who I am, right? But good lord, if if I were to try and talk to someone who's like, I don't want to talk about this, I would be like, oh, okay, I don't know how to be around you either. Yeah, yeah, the feeling is mutual. I have to say, too, whoever did the illustration for this, they made the guy who's the bigot the biggest Chad I've ever seen in my life. He just has everything about him just screams. Is he like a Johnny Bravo Yes, Chad, he's or? got Johnny okay, Bravo okay. hair and, like, chiseled features, <laughs> and he's a Chad, bro. Can I just say, Johnny Bravo, good show. <laughs> That's, That's good it. Show. No, I like that. <laughs> now... Method two would be understanding gay people. Hey, now we're into something here. Number one, focus on the person, not their sexuality. Obsessing over what they do in the bedroom won't help you interact with them, and they'll probably think you're a creep. (laughs) Yes! Do not concentrate on what I do in the bedroom when you meet me, please. That's... Can I just say, that's applicable for just about every situation. It's like the things that you shouldn't say about trans people for queer people. It's... Hey, you have a dick. Maybe. What do you do with that dick? I, fucking. Does that really matter to. Hey, we're playing basketball right now. Can we just not with this? If you have a queer member on your basketball team and you ask them what they do with their dick, that is way too personal for any situation, <laughs> let alone basketball. That's also a really gay thing to say. That's. <laughs> 
<laughs> super gay. If you're asking men how they what they do with their dicks, that's way too gay. Now, it does suggest that if you want to know more about LGBTQ individuals, consume media that contains them. Try watching movies and TV shows that include LGBTQ folks in their ordinary lives, like The Fosters and The Kids Are I, All... No, I've I, never I, seen any one of those shows. Somebody tell us if those are good representations of lgbtq i do just also want to say that my brain did not immediately go to watching as consuming content so i was thinking i'd have to pick up a dvd of like elliot page or something and just eat it whole oh just eat yeah, it just eat See, it my brain went to <laughs> watch gay porn and then <laughs> see see if you understand better at the end of the day specifically gay porn though if you're a man and you're watching lesbian porn if, if sorry if you're a straight man and you're watching lesbian porn no you know what if you're a man and you're watching lesbian porn please just don't fetishize it please don't <laughs> fetishize that please don't fetishize trans people let's just get i should have said queer porn I, yeah i unfortunately have gotten into the linguistic stylings of this article where gay is an overarching, overarching term, term for yeah all queer people D- please don't watch queer porn unless you're queer or you're questioning because otherwise it just feels wrong <laughs> now that reminds me to say don't associate lgbtq individuals with promiscuous or immoral behavior yeah. Studies show that gay people are no more likely to be child molesters than straight folks are. I was just about to say... Okay, and that's, again, where I get pissed off by this article, though, because it immediately went to the trope. Here's the thing. I'm glad they're diffusing it, but I'm like, how about gay people have as much sex or are as promiscuous or as immoral as any other human being on this planet. That's- Here's my thought on it. Like, my brain immediately went to the, like, pedophile trope. Because that's what I've been told from these fucking media people for so many years. Is like, to associate gay people with pedophiles. And I'm like... <laughs> Dif- diffusing that has to be a part of the conversation because it is so fucking common. Yes. And it's something that I have to defend myself against as a trans woman all the time, too. Thank you, people like J.K. Rowling, for that. That was sarcastic. The last section of this method three is using Christianity to practice love. <laughs> so the article has definitely honed in on there is a segment of our population who might be Christian who are using their Christianity to be transphobic or anti-LGBTQ. Number two on this list of Christian practices is consider that no one follows every passage in the Bible. The oft-quoted Leviticus also tells people not to wear clothes of different fabrics, yet many good Christians do this. And then there's a picture of someone eating a lobster, (laughs) which isn't even brought up in the article. (laughs) You're thinking about the different fabrics that you're wearing right now. Eat this lobster. Don't wear clothes of different fabrics. Here's a lobster. And then finally, I think... Go ahead. I'm just imagining you get to the pearly gates and God's... I'm sorry, bud. You wore different clothes. Like, you wore clothes of different fabrics. Here's a lobster, though. Enjoy. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> you get to eat this lobster while you burn for all eternity. Good luck down there. And then finally, recognize Jesus' acceptance of LGBTQ folks. Several quotes. True. I'm convinced that Jesus is a trans man. Like, you can't convince me otherwise of that. Jesus was definitely a trans man, and he was also super fucking gay. Like, he walked around with a bunch of men through the fucking deserts and shit. What do you think they were doing to keep themselves entertained? Doing gay shit, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, he was shown to be in the Bible kind to same-gender couples and stood up for the oppressed. He suggested that some men are born eunuchs. Okay, I don't like that language. That's bad language. But maybe lost in translation from the original Hebrew. And that heterosexual marriage is not the right path for everyone. Okay, I need to look up that passage. That's fascinating. Yeah, this... I'm learning new things about the Bible, and I've taken a religious studies class specifically targeting, like the Bible as a whole. That's very interesting. In one passage, Jesus heals a gay man's lover and shows them acceptance without criticizing their love. And then overall, Christianity encourages people to love and accept one another no matter what. That's very true. Also, I didn't mean for this to get quite so focused on Christianity. Also, sorry, Christians and Catholics and just about anybody who follows the God. Yeah, like the Abrahamic religion. The Pope accepts gay people. So get with it. (laughs) Get with it. (laughs) Hi, 
I'm Anna, a transgender person. And I'm Cam, your dad. And this is The Transgender, a podcast chronicling my transition. And a cisgender man learning how to support it. Halloween is coming up. The slash has already passed. I have no idea when this episode is coming out. But Halloween is this time of year. And I want to talk about Halloween and trans people. Well, Halloween is my very favorite holiday, so I will happily talk at length about it. Halloween is my favorite holiday as well. I will literally celebrate it all year round. We just moved into a new place, and it is going to be Halloween decorated the entire year. Yes. Cam, my dad, what do you remember about me growing up as a child and, like, my preferences for, like, costumes and other things like that that might have given away the fact that I might be trans? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's an interesting question. I can't think of anything in particular, actually. I think there's, with a lot of kids, it works out this way, and I'm finding this with Oliver. There's the early years where costumes are, I wouldn't say dictated by your parents, but definitely influenced as the people buying you your costumes. Mm-hmm. And then you hit late elementary school to middle school, and then I think that conversation probably lessens where the parent isn't necessarily as involved in your costume choice. And so, For the life of me, I can't think of costumes that I was involved with prior to probably third or fourth grade with you. I remember your very first Halloween costume I made, and you were dressed (laughs) as a bumblebee, and it was adorable. (laughs) See, I'm asking you this question because I don't remember a lot of my costumes. I think that one of the ones that I do remember was the Headless Horseman costume. And that was because I was in the play (laughs) Sleepy Hollow at that exact time. And so it was like fresh on the mind. That was a super cool costume too. Like an off-the-shelf costume that really worked quite well in making you headless. It was super freaking cool. And I'm just thinking like that one had a very flowy gown-like style to it. Yeah. I definitely think that in some ways I was trying to express femininity in ways that I could. I will say... When I got into, I think, late middle school, early high school, I went (laughs) trick-or-treating with a couple of my friends, and we went to the west side of town near Piedmont, if you're in Duluth, and we walked around a lot, and I was dressed as a Egyptian, like, priestess. (laughs) Cool! And it was one of my favorite costumes. I had a lot of help from my... Very good friend, Sky, at that point. And it was her, my friend Hunter Marshall, who, shout out Hunter Marshall, he's living his life, and uh, we met at Trans Joy Fest, or no, we went at Pride, and that was yes. super fun. But yeah, no. Like- and this was around the same time that you were also starting to present more femininely in general. Exactly, so- yes. This was just not to your family. Exactly. <laughs> at this point. Yes, this was the time where I was wearing a skirt in school, where I was wearing leggings and Ugg boots and things like that out and about as much as I could, but not necessarily around my family because of certain things that made me feel unsafe at that point. But Halloween was the saving grace for me. If I had told you I was going to go out as a Egyptian goddess or whatever, I don't think you would have had any problems with that. And I I would not have blinked an eye. As a matter of fact, until Oliver landed on his Link from a Legend of Zelda costume, <laughs> he had wanted to wear a Princess Peach costume this it year out. It was a out, really and cool costume, I do have to say. <laughs> it's really cute, and he looks like an accurate Link representation with the long hair and everything but the princess peace costume was also awesome and i was very much encouraging like yeah yeah it's like there's i do not want you for a second to hesitate and think that it's not okay for you to be able to wear that that's totally okay and i i think that is amazing like halloween for me was really stressful for a lot of my life yeah. because it was like can i go as something that i want to go as or can i not and it, it, I have to admit, for some years, I didn't go as what I wanted to go as, and I had to default to a mix of clothing that I had at that point, because I, like, had planned a costume, had planned a costume, had really gone into it, and then I was like, I don't feel comfortable doing this and backed out. And I know that is a time for a lot of trans people, too. I know so many stories of trans people who are like, what if I, like, go as a girl for Halloween, or something like that? Or what if I go as a boy for Halloween, and it's it's a way to express your gender without ever really outing yourself? I think... Nowadays, it would be more acceptable for someone to go out as a boy or girl for trick-or-treating and, like, really go into the stereotypes and not necessarily feel the same amount of fear, at least 
from where I'm like my perspective looking out, I see a lot more opportunity for that to be expressed. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that it like you're more in tune with the kids because you have a a child in <laughs> school? Have a small yes. one. Yeah. Well it's interesting because I think I probably worry more about the potential conflict with peers when it comes to these sorts of things. I don't know how other kids are being raised to look at gender. I agree that there is certainly more openness, and I will say this is a a tangential (laughs) anecdote, but I think it proves the point. So I'm parked at Oliver's school going to pick him up, and somebody parks behind me as i'm walking back to my vehicle i get the dreaded it's terrifying when somebody goes is this your car and i just my mind is reeling and i'm like what the hell what's going on and this person says i really like your bumper stickers which were all trans and lgbt bumper stickers ran into their car grabbed me a sticker which i ended up giving to anna that's I don't even remember what it said. It was just total anti- It says, I trust drag queens more than church leaders. Yes, that's what it was. (laughs) It's on my car now. If this person is listening, (laughs) it's on my car, and I fucking love it. It is such a good bumper sticker. After an article came out in the news tribute, that person messaged me on (laughs) social media and said, wait, are you the person I gave the sticker to? And I was like, yes. So that alone made me feel so much more comfortable about the other kinds of parents that I'm dealing with day to day at Oliver's school. And that doesn't say everybody, but it just gives me a glimmer of hope that there's a contingent of us there who are open-minded enough to raise our kids in a way that's going to be very gender open. <laughs> yeah. And I just also want to say a, a shout out to Oliver's school, like the person who I remember most from my middle school days, like the person who helped me so much when I was going through some of the hardest times of my life is now in a role of a a manager position there i don't remember her yeah overseeing yeah exactly and she is i'm not gonna name her out of respect (laughs) for her but if you're listening you are literally one of my favorite people and i think you'll know who you are but seriously (laughs) this person is so amazing and she is running the school now that oliver is attending and i just hope that she has the same energy and the same care and support that she had for me that she's giving to other students too who might be going through really difficult situations. And and I'll vouch for it. I know she does. And I I know it's why Oliver is going to the same school because (laughs) that level of support is there. And I feel it as a parent and know that he is getting the same kind of support that you were able to receive when you were there. So moving a little bit. Nope, we can't start it with so every time. Every (laughs) single goddamn time. It's also a good transition. We took Halloween and and moved moved it right to talking to kids. Taking what we were just talking about with the school and everything, I wanted to talk a little bit about being young and being trans and how those two are often villainized. Uh, Is that a word? Okay. Yes. And how those two are Vilified. 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 I think it's vilified. Yes. And how those two are often vilified, especially now with all of the anti-trans legislation and other bullshit that people are trying to push on us. (laughs) In the past, it was assumed that many trans kids would detransition after hitting puberty. But the kids who were studied were often not trans, just diagnosed with gender identity disorder, and they often never identified as trans. So they just had this diagnosis of gender identity disorder. Right. The most recent long-term study started in 2013 and is currently following kids for 20 years after they socially transition. So we're talking children like four, three, six-year-olds who are being tracked for 20 years to see where they end up in their adult life and how they how they might live. And this study only has information on the first five years released. However, the kids studied who socially transitioned between the ages of 3 and 12 overwhelmingly still identify as trans. 2.5%, or 8 kids total, have transitioned back to identifying as their gender assigned at birth, 7 of whom transitioned back before the age of 9, so before they started puberty. And I would say that is much higher than the average detransition rate. Yes. However... Which is less than 1% nationally, exactly, isn't it? Yes. According to, again, the spotty research, because this is still not studied well enough, but, but it also, there's not, we don't even have a lot of anecdotal evidence of exactly. detransitioning. But so. what I want to say here is these kids are not being forced by their parents. They are not like no. having any influence. They are just trying out things. It's like how we try out so many things when we're a kid. You want to try a different haircut? You try out a different haircut. 
these kids are trying a different gender to see if it matches them. And so 2.5% seems like a really low amount to detransition. Can you just quick define for folks, because I think this is a topic we haven't talked a ton about, what a social transition versus a medical transition is. I, it sounds logical in cases, <laughs> but we know a lot of people who are putting out misinformation are getting these things convoluted. Yes, so a social transition is typically a trying out a different name or different names, um, using different pronouns than the ones assigned at birth trying out different clothing styles, trying out different mannerisms and things like that, just really experimenting and coming out as coming out and trying things and expressing things that might not align with their sex assigned at birth. A medical transition is where we get into the things like hormones, puberty blockers, surgeries, all the things that might lie under a medical thing. And I'm going to specify here, this does not include therapy, and this does not include any minor steps taken. So, you know, if your kid has a eye problem, it doesn't include you getting them glasses that are more feminine. That would be a social transition thing. This is specifically hormones, purity blockers, surgeries. That's what falls under medical transition. So when we hear the argument, and I I know you're going to talk about medical transition in a second, but when we hear the argument, kids need to wait until they're 18 before they figure this stuff <laughs> out. And there's no reason anybody should be. What I know what our response to this is, but I want to hear you say it. Like, what are we saying? I'm saying you're exactly right. And I think that we should put all kids on puberty blockers until the time where they feel confident in their gender identity. What is it about trans kids that makes us say you don't know your identity until you're 18, but a cis kid can go and you know, live their life and go through puberty, a life-changing thing, and there's no question about it. And then they go through puberty and then truly discover what their gender identity is, and now the work is even harder. Exactly. And the work that transphobes point out all of the time as the problematic part of all of this could have easily have been presented with something that is quite harmless, which you're about to talk yeah. about. So trans kids are often used to justify fear-mongering about trans people in general. People often assume that trans kids are groomed into identifying as trans, which is not true, have social pressures to identify as trans, again, not true, and have, quote, irreversible medical procedures forced upon them. All of which, I I would have to say, where are your sources? Because yeah, there's zero evidence none of, any of those of that are things occurring. that I have ever heard of happening. It's really extremely hard to force a kid to not be trans. It's really hard to force a kid to be trans. Right. Like, it's impossible, I would say. And really what you're just doing is you are allowing them the option to explore, which is what we give kids all the time. You take a kid out to a park, they're gonna eat shit that's on the ground, they're gonna (laughs) play- (laughs) Hopefully not (laughs) Not shit so much. They're gonna play with a squirrel, they're gonna jump in a river, like, they're gonna (laughs) do shit, and you're gonna be like, oh, that's just a kid doing kid stuff. We should look at that for gender as well. And even when we talk about, like, part of exploration, we ask three-year-olds, what are you going to be when you grow up? (laughs) And the part that boggles my mind is, first of all, no three-year-old knows what they're going to be when they grow up. That's... (laughs) It's so rare. And those people that do grow up to be the thing they identify when they're three, uh, that's amazing. But hey, we're talking you, a, st- I, statistically unlikely. You asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said a woman, so I think I'm in that statistic. Yep. Here you are. You grew up to what you wanted to be, or what you are, I should say. But it's so interesting. I think about this in the same way. We define ourselves by our careers, and that is a social construct. We also define ourselves by our gender, and that's a social construct. (laughs) It's it's the closest parallel I can think of for things we force three-year-olds to figure out that is not necessarily something that a three-year-old is ready to figure out. I've never heard a three-year-old say, oh, I'm going to be a data analyst when I grow up. No, that's not what they say. (laughs) No kidding. I'm going to go into actuarial sciences. (laughs) Like, that it just doesn't make sense and it's something that we should be asking but we shouldn't be taking seriously (laughs) but similar to gender allow the three-year-old to try and figure out what they want to do like a career you can buy them play sets if they said doctor you can get them things that might let them try out being a doctor i know i've seen like toy stethoscopes and i've seen like little clinics and things and even if you don't have the funds to be able to do that you can try and role play with them and things like that. Yeah. Same thing should be done with gender. 
I'm not saying you have to go and buy your kid a whole new wardrobe. I'm not saying anything like that, but let them role play. Let them try and experiment with these things because that is how we encourage people to be themselves. And aside from some kind of weird societally driven shame that you feel as a parent having a uh, child wear <laughs> clothes that are traditionally the other gender, there is zero reason not to. There are, there are no psychological impacts. You are not impairing your child. You are not doing anything negative to them. You are actually doing the opposite. You are providing a greater level experience, which provides more neural pathways for them to experience the world with greater depth of knowledge. So do exactly. it. Exactly. Let them try all kinds of Fucking stuff. Fucking exactly. Kids who are under the age of 12 transition typically will just mean pronouns, perhaps a name, haircut, and or clothing, poise, and decorative choices. All things that can be changed. <laughs> like, those are all things that are pretty easy to change. Yes. Not legally for the name and pronouns, but just... Use whatever your kid wants you to use for them. Trans kids are not getting surgery at 12. They're not getting hormones at 12. The most they might get is puberty blockers. And puberty blockers are a completely safe and completely reversible thing that I recommend anybody who might be experimenting with their gender look for. Yeah, tell us more about that. What does a hormone blocker do? Yeah, so hormone blockers were initially developed for cisgender kids who were undergoing precocious puberty, which is like a puberty that is coming on significantly early if you're going through puberty at four. <laughs> but they have since been used on trans kids. If hormone blockers are stopped, the body will go through puberty as it was already going to go through. If you are a cisgender man and you were on puberty blockers, you would have experienced a deeper voice. You would have experienced facial hair growth. You would experience higher muscle mass. All the things that we consider are masculine things caused by testosterone. If you were a cis woman in that situation, you would start ovulating. You would have everything that happens with a female puberty, breast development, things like that would continue. Even with hormone blockers, children who are transitioning can change their minds and continue the puberty that was already going to happen. It doesn't inhibit right. anything. You can go through puberty at 18. <laughs> you can go through puberty at 25. It's okay. And I think it's very well needed. And also, it's awkward no matter when you exactly. go through puberty. Yeah. <laughs> And for trans people, it's going through a second puberty. Yes. So it, again, it's just the arguments against these things of this is the natural way our bodies work. And we, yes, for some uh -huh. people, that is true. But for a large segment of society, that natural puberty happens in really terrifying and weird ways. It's not necessarily a, a puberty that is going to be aligned with their gender identity. And so why, if a child is still questioning what their future identity is going to look like. Why are we forcing them exactly. to, to go through this really traumatic process? And this is the one thing, like, this is whether you're trans or cis, you, if you were an adult person, you have likely been through puberty. Yes. And so we can all align to the same thing. Of We know what this is. <laughs> it sucks. It's hard going through puberty. And so, like, why are you subjecting trans people to a second puberty? Mm -hmm. The right. current practice for hormone therapy for trans youth is started no earlier than 16 years old. However, the WPATH, or the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, suggests that trans youth might be eligible for hormone therapy at age 14 instead. This is after extensive evaluation by medical professionals. So this is not happening lightly. It's like anything else when you're trans, it takes years and years of bureaucracy and therapy and other shit that has to happen before any of this is considered. And even then, we're still having children go through this, likely after some of the early onset of puberty has started. And maybe this is where we say this, we believe in the science. Yes. We truly believe in the science. And we want to find the healthiest path to transition that people can experience. So uh, the problem is the science is brand new because people have been not okay funding <laughs> this kind of research. I have not been okay acknowledging that this is even something that's worth researching. And so we, I, I think, I don't want to speak for both of us, but I am a little bit here going to say, I think we're on the same page that we will continue to follow the science. And as long as these are considered to be healthy practices, 14 or 16, we believe that the people who are studying this very thoroughly with peer reviewed, the double blind studies that, you know, are actually looking at the science in a way that is meaningful. That's what we're going to follow when we're making recommendations and not just our gut feeling exactly. that a 14-year-old is more 
or a 16 year even the, the age part is pretty irrelevant it's the science part that matters exactly I want kids to be, have access to these as early as they feel comfortable starting these. However, I'm not going to actually recommend that unless the science backs it up. So right. if a W path who I trust extremely, like they are one of the best sources that we use here, says that the current age should be 14, I'm going to recommend 14 for just about everyone. It might be worth also saying that when we talk about W path, we're talking about healthcare professionals who are often cis. Yes. Or we're not talking about some kind of trans cabal exactly. who is making up healthcare <laughs> science. And again, I just, I, I keep thinking about if Tucker Carlson were listening, what would his <laughs> arguments be? And it's all misinformation. Yeah. This is a group of health professionals who see transgender patients and want to provide the best care possible. Exactly. And just to clear up any other arguments, any type of gender affirming surgery is extremely rare for anyone under the age of 18, especially gender surgery. So we are not transing your kids. We are not trying to medically transition them before they're ready. We're not doing anything like that. Everything takes a lot of time. And I will tell you, yep. as somebody who at 18 started looking into t- different types of surgery, I am now 21 and I am just about to get surgery. So do not think that this is something that is easy or ta- is like something that's happening like frequently or anything like that. This takes a lot of effort and time. Yeah. You don't show up to your healthcare provider and ask for a prescription to be transgender <laughs> and then they sign it. So many exactly. things that can be prescribed in our society right now. This is one thing that continues to need multiple professionals involved that has a lengthy process of waiting. And we're not saying that part of this is good by any no. means. This needs to be opened up more. But any arguments that you can just walk into a doctor's office and walk out with genital surgery, <laughs> it's just not even remotely Ex- the truth. Exactly. Abigail Schreier, you can go fuck yourself. That's not at all how it works. And you fucking know that. And especially if you're under 18, it's just, it's not happening. There's not evidence that this is happening in our our country. Exactly. The last bit of this that I want to really touch on is a call of action to everyone who's listening. Trans kids are being targeted by legislation, including some recent pushes to criminalize gender affirming care for trans youth. Supportive family is one of the strongest indicators of positive mental health for trans kids. And we need to support that. Yes. One such piece of legislation that is targeting trans kids is proposed in Michigan, and it calls for putting parents who support their child's gender identity into prison for life. This is not okay. Accepting your child for who they are and helping them find care is not child abuse. It does not call for any type of prison sentence, let alone for life. Can, Go ahead. I was just going to say, can you imagine? It's all I'm trying to do in my work is be more supportive of my child. And the idea that I could go to prison for life for that, it's terrifying. It's the only part of this that is terrifying for me. Yeah. Because it's not about me. But all of a sudden, let's punish parents and medical providers for supporting trans health care. That it's the most ludicrous and absolutely dystopian thing I can possibly imagine. It, it, along with jailing transgender people yes. for life. Like, That's where this all leads. Alabama has a law currently on the books that makes it a felony to treat trans children with puberty blockers or hormones. So it is currently stayed until challenges can make their way through the courts. A portion of the bill that forces educators to out trans children to their parents was not blocked, however. So if you are a trans child in Alabama and you feel like school is a safe place and home is not, I'm afraid that school is no longer a safe place for you either. And that needs to change. Several other states also have legislation criminalizing trans care for children, either past or currently proposed. I am, this is serious on a time. I am asking every single one of our listeners to look up the laws for your state and see if there are any of these laws either on the books or currently proposed and fight them because this is not okay. This is not how we treat people in our country. And I don't want to live in a country where I can go to jail for life. My father can go for, to jail for life or really anyone for just existing and go to jail for life. And this episode will go out before the 2022 elections. Go out and vote. Please. Find out candidate positions on trans care and LGBTQ support in general and support candidates that are about rights for people, that are about human rights. That's the only way these things get changed. And 
There's one in particular, we've already shouted her out, but Sydney McElroy lives in a state <laughs> where the trans legislation is being proposed that criminalizes trans care. And it's the type of person that we just believe needs to be put on a pedestal and said, this is the kind of politician we want because they support trans health. Exactly. Please go out to vote and vote for people who will support trans people because we exist and we deserve human rights. Today's gender euphoria to bring things up to a lighter mood is sent in from Center. I do just want to say that there is mild transphobia in this, so a trigger warning if that is going to trigger anyone. I worked at a retail store when I started my transition. The regulars never picked up on anything, but I would gauge my transition by the new people who came in and gendered me. Not so great for mental health. My first experience of euphoria was when a customer said, thank you, ma'am, sir, whatever the fuck you are, and went through polite... Oh, Went through polite to confused and angry in the span of seconds and then left. I was on cloud nine after that XD. Somebody actually gendered me correctly after 25 years of never getting gendered correctly once. So I want to say if you are the person who we started the episode with saying, you know, how to be around queer people and you told somebody, thank you, ma'am, sir, whatever the fuck you are. It was funny enough that one of our listeners sent in a euphoria about it. (laughs) <laughs> found some euphoria. Thank you, Thank Center. You, Center. That's, <laughs> that's a very candid way and also a way to look positively at what is a pretty shitty way to acknowledge your existence on this planet. So we're acknowledging you. We're acknowledging you. you. Thank you. If you have questions about transitioning or supporting someone who is transitioning and you'd like us to talk about it on the show, please shoot an email to questions at transgenderpod.com, click the chat with us button on our website, or DM us on social media. Hey, speaking of our website, we have some new merch Ooh. up. I have to say, I love the new Hide Your Crotch one. It is my <laughs> new favorite sticker. Close, like closely above the titty sticker. It's certainly one of my favorites as well. A Groucho mask above some pants. It uh, goes back to an earlier episode where <laughs> an article had said to disguise your crotch and we thought it was pretty funny. So we put it on a sticker like we tend to do. Please go ahead and pick that up or you can join the Backstage Pass Plus sticker club level on our Patreon and you can get stickers just like that sent to you on a monthly basis. <gasps> just like Amy K who is a Backstage Pass level patron. Thank you so much, Amy. We really appreciate your support. And be sure to check out our episode description for links to resources on today's topic, especially linked to websites that might include information on gender legislation and information on puberty blockers and the W Path. Thanks for listening. I've been Cam. And I've been Anna. And this has been The Transgender. Love you all, except the bigots. Would you like to support our podcast? Well, you're in luck. We have a Patreon now. Just visit patreon.com slash transgendapod, and for as little as $3 a month, you can support the content that we're creating. And for $20 a month, you can join our sticker club, which provides you with a monthly live stream, a shout out on the podcast, and a sticker every month from ourselves and creators that we adore. Again, just visit patreon.com slash transgendapod, and thank you for all your support.